Good evening. Welcome to the June 3rd, 2014 Planning and Zoning Commission, Raymore, Missouri. Uh, call to order. We're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance to start. All right, we want to get a uh, roll call for the official record. Make sure your microphones are on. Uh, Commissioner Anderson. Present. Commissioner Crane. Commissioner Pfizer. Present. Commissioner Grotsky. Commissioner Hanner. Present. Commissioner Meiske. Present. Mayor Kirkhoff. Present and Chairman Burke, Acting Chairman Burke, present. We do have a quorum uh, tonight. We have, uh, to start, we have personal appearance by Councilman Ryan Westcote. If you want to come to the podium and speak. Thank you. First, I want to start off by saying thank you all for your service. Uh, as someone who usually sits up there on Monday night, um, I appreciate everything that you guys do. Um, I came tonight because uh, I wanted to address uh, a proposal that's before you tonight, which is the Ridgeway, uh, Ridgeway Villas. Um, the council has actually seen this proposal twice, um, but for a different reason than what you guys are actually making the decision on for tonight. But I thought it was important for you guys to understand the history uh, this proposal has had with the city as you get ready to vet uh, this project. Um, this proposal was presented to us uh, in, in two previous years. Uh, each time it was presented to us, the council um, refused to take action on it and actually declined to support uh, what it was that they were trying to do. Um, just so that you guys understand the history, and I, and I don't know what's exactly in your packet, uh, this product, uh, project is being funded by the LIHTC, which is the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. This program was designed to handle blight in urban areas. It was to encourage development in areas where de uh, developers had abandoned. Um, so, you know, one of the challenges that we found is that, you know, Raymore doesn't necessarily fit the definition of a, of a blighted area. Um, as the information was presented, uh, there were several, um, several things that were presented to us in a fashion that uh, some of us felt were deceptive, uh, misleading. Uh, one of the things and issues that we had a challenge with is that when it was proposed to us, uh, they proposed that they were going to uh, kind of gear it towards veterans and that they wanted veterans to, to be the people who were actually going to purchase the, the units and, and be the main residents. And then I received a letter from the organization uh, in August of 2013, a, a certified letter, and, and in which it says that they're only going to set aside six units for special needs and for veterans. You know, so, you know, it was kind of, we were led to believe that that was the focus, and then when we get follow-up correspondence, <coughs> it, sorry, it, it wasn't there. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not here to influence you one way or the other. I just felt that it was important for you guys to understand the history so that as you go through your process, that you make sure that you give it the scrutiny that, that the project deserves. Um, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Councilman Westcote. All right. Next on our agenda, we have uh, two items on the consent agenda. Uh, we first have the acceptance of the minutes from the May 6, 2014 meeting, and we also have case 14015, the Ridgeway Villas at the Legends Final Plat. If we want to uh, open any discussion amongst the commission on these on the consent agenda. Or hear any motions to that, uh, Mr. Vice Chair? I, um, if we would, can we? Well, we can move forward because it's actually a case under new business. So I'll present. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as uh, as presented. I'll second. We have a motion to 
Ex approve the consent agenda from Commissioner Anderson, a second by Commissioner Meiske. If we can have a uh, show of hands that will approve the uh, to the motion. Any uh, same sign as opposed? The count is six in favor, zero. Uh, zero, zero unopposed and uh, zero abstentions. When we have, we, we did not have any old business to look at. It brings us to new business. We have case number 14017, the Ridgeway Villas at the Legends site plan. If the applicant would like to speak to this case, we will begin the hearing of this case. Let me remind all speakers to state your name and address for the record. If possible, please limit your comments to a few minutes. Hi, my name is Axel Novion, N-O-V-I-O-N. I'm an engineer with GeoSource LLC. Uh, Ridgeway Villas. At the Legends is a 56 unit, two story development consisting of uh, unit sizes from duplexes all the way up to eight plexes. It's located south of 58 Highway, east of Mott Drive, and west of Scott Drive. Uh, there's also an associated clubhouse that's planned. Uh, the units will be serviced by existing utilities, and there are uh, associated parking and drive areas. Uh, staff comments have been received, they've been addressed and they've been incorporated into the modified site plans that were submitted May 27th of this year. And that's what I have. If there are any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Mr. Cataret, can you give us the staff report on this case? Uh, yes, sir, thank you. Uh, as the uh, applicant's representative indicated, uh, the request uh, before you is the uh, site plan for the Ridgeway Villas uh, at the Legends. Uh, just for general location, um, the property in question is part of the Legends subdivision, which is located on the south side of Foxwood Drive, 58 Highway, at its intersection with Mott Drive. Basically, uh, most of the undeveloped land um, south of Cinnabar Drive, which is south of the Culver's Restaurant. In the uh, staff report, I included an aerial photograph that outlined the uh, parcels that are proposed for the site plan approval this evening. It's also on the map on your screen, which identifies three lots. Uh, and there's also a uh, tract A, which is a detention basin area. The proposed um, 56 dwelling units and uh, clubhouse building would be located on lots one, two, and three. I also included in your packet uh, photographs uh, of the property, uh, just generally with the intent of trying to show the uh, layout of the property. It does show you in a few instances the slope of the property that that is being dealt with as part of this project. Also included the uh, a zoning map, which does identify the zoning of this property uh, as R3A. Uh, so this property is zoned multiple family residential. Uh, it does allow for uh, townhome units, both Older occupied and renter occupied so the use that's proposed as part of the site plan is allowed as a permitted use the uh, surrounding zoning we do have the Foxhaven subdivision uh, to the south and to the west of the uh, proposed development Foxhaven is zoned R1 to the north is the commercial land within the ledges and it's all zoned PUD uh, planned unit development with the commercial designation and then the undeveloped land to the east a uh, property that's owned by the uh, Dean family. It's undeveloped, but is currently zoned regional commercial. I did identify in the uh, staff report uh, that the proposed use is compliant with our future land use plan map. They also identified two goal statements uh, in, our, in our GMP to which this project uh, does, does uh, help to meet the uh, action step identified in the goal statement. So I, I spell those out in your, in your report. 
Uh, regarding previous actions on the property, uh, the there are uh, within the legends currently uh, uh, 34 existing townhome units. There re would remain, if this project is approved and built out, there remains uh, two lots that are undeveloped. They would be on the west side of the central detention basin. Uh, they are privately held lots uh, that there would be allowed for two additional buildings on those lots. So even after this project, if it is approved, there still is room for an additional 16 dwelling units uh, on those two lots. Again, not part of this project, not owned by the, uh, by the current owner of the land for the Ridgeway Villas, but I just want to identify that there are still remains some undeveloped land within this, within this project. The engineering division did submit uh, their review of the project, uh, both on the plat and the, uh, the, the site plan, and, and specifically regarding uh, utilities. There are, there are adequate water, sewer, and storm sewer capabilities to serve this development. Uh, other staff comments, uh, I did identify first the development standards, which are your setbacks, your building coverage, all of your UDC code requirements uh, regarding the, the location of the buildings. They have all uh, been complied with, with with the site plan. There are some special use standards for uh, attached single family and multiple family dwelling units. These uh, deal with separation of building, uh, building design. I simply uh, uh, identified those code requirements and, and make the comment that the proposed site plan is in compliance with all the use standards. Regarding parking, uh, our parking code requires one and a half space for each dwelling unit. Uh, each proposed dwelling unit has a garage, a single car garage, with a parking driveway space in front of the garage. So each unit does have two spaces. So the parking requirement is exceeded for, for the project. Uh, regarding the landscaping, they did submit a landscape plan. It, it does meet the requirements of our landscape uh, code. There are, they're also proposing the type A screening, which is required along the southern property line of lot two and the western property line of lot three. Your staff report illustrates the type of screening that they're, they're proposing to have. It's a, a combination of, of uh, evergreens and uh, deciduous uh, trees. So it does meet our requirement for our screening. Identified uh, site access. Of course, all the existing road network is in place. You can't access the, the development from Cinnabar, uh, uh, which connects to Foxhaven or directly to the, uh, the lighted, lighted intersection at Mott 58. Uh, pedestrian connectivity will exist when uh, the development connects to sidewalks that exist along Cinnabar. Ultimately, when the commercial development is completed, then there'll be connectivity to the sidewalk and 58 highway. Uh, there currently are street lights within the development as well as lighting requirements for the individual units. They do intend to install a monument sign to identify the uh, project name. The proposed sign is in compliance with our code. As I mentioned, the building design standards have been complied with. Um, as we reviewed the buildings, they're going to be very similar in design and style as the existing uh, townhome units. They will have a few of the uh, duplex two-family units that are that are slightly different than the existing units, but the uh, multiple-family townhome buildings, whether it's five, six, or eight-unit buildings, are very similar to the existing townhomes. Uh, the stormwater uh, control system uh, for the subdivision is being utilized for this development. It was planned to be utilized by, by these townhomes, um, so they are compliant with our stormwater control regulations. Uh, there are some amenities that are being proposed. Uh, there is a, uh, a pavilion and a playground area being proposed for common area uh, within the subdivision, as well as a community building uh, that would be proposed uh, on the very north side of the development of, of Lot 1. Uh, staff has submitted proposed findings of fact regarding the site plan review. Uh, we do recommend that the commission accept those uh, proposed findings and approve the site plan for the Ridgeway Villas at the Legends, uh, subject to a total of 11 conditions. Uh, most of these conditions are, are fa fairly standard when we do a site plan review. We have three conditions that have to be met prior to commencement of any land disturbance activity, and, and those are consistent with, uh, again, general conditions that we have. Uh, we do note uh, the proposed recommended condition number three uh, deals with an existing swale system that's been in place 
uh, and this whale exists along the south side of lot two and along the uh, west side of lot three, uh, which are, are adjacent to the residential single family uh, subdivisions. These existing swales uh, do um, uh, currently provide value to the existing single family homes, and so we're wanting to make sure that those are not impacted in any way. They, they cannot, and they're actually easements where these swales are located as a drainage utility easement. And so we, we simply do not want any grading activity or construction activity to occur within those, those existing swales. We have three conditions um, that would need to be met prior to issuance of a building permit, and one of them does include the approval and recording of the final plat, which you recommended earlier. That final plat does need to be recorded in order for the uh, site plan to be effective and permits to be issued. And then we have uh, four conditions under, that need to be met under uh, prior to issuance of a certificate of occupancy. And these are, are notations regarding the project and, and things that have to occur before any of the units could be occupied. Uh, and then a general condition uh, that is placed on all of our approvals regarding illicit discharge uh, from any activity on the property. Uh, so those are the recommended conditions um, for the uh, proposal this evening and uh, staff uh, is available for any questions. I'll open the floor for uh, discussion by the commission on this case. Commissioner Meister. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Ganarek, I got since the Commissioner Faulkner is not here to shoot me. Um, question, several months ago, um, we voted on, I guess that's uh, north of area one there. And I can't remember what it was, but I know there was a stipulation in there that you can't build on a certain part of that property. Yes, that's Does correct. Does that include the number one? I mean, that part or? Is it north of that? It is It is all the land area north of lot one. one. Okay. So that's so all the area that is proposed for commercial. It's known as Foxwood Plaza lot one. That's what it was, yeah. And so the southern portion of that Foxwood Plaza lot one cannot be used for a building, could be used for parking. Right, okay. Yes. So that's not included in this? No, okay. no. Okay. But it was anticipated when, when they <laughs> enlarged the lot one for the commercial use they knew how the Ridgeway Villas project was going to match up, and that's that's why the line is okay. where it is. I, I just want to make sure. Yes. In Mr. Commissioner there. Meiske, I think part of what you're recalling is the uh, part that the CID and the TIF um, did only went to part of so, that pro parcel, right. and they said that they would not build on the part that did not right. and did okay. not. Uh, I just be want to be included make in sure that. it wasn't included in this. Okay. Second question. Um, have we done any traffic studies as far as we only have one light up at uh, Mott and Foxwood? Um, if that gets overcrowded, everybody's going to shoot over, you know, Snyder Bar up to Campbell and try to get out there. Has anybody looked at that as far as another light there? A, uh, a couple of traffic couple management type. Yes, sir. A couple of responses. Uh, a traffic study was not required for the specific Ridgeway Villas project. There was one done for the Legends overall project, okay. which did propose um, considerably higher number of total units. So it, with the Ridgeway Villas project, the actual number of units that we had approved back in 2003 has been decreased. In fact, okay. the overall number of dwelling units has gone down a couple of times uh, since the approval of the project. I, I can't tell you there has been, um, there has been uh, prior to the installation of the signal at Mott Drive, it was looked at at having uh, potentially a signal at uh, where you have the Campbell and um, uh, the, the Foxhaven uh, uh, subdivision entrance there. Uh, but it was felt that the Mott Drive was the more appropriate location for the signal. The traffic study showed us that, and that's why okay. we have the signal at Mott Drive. But again, the overall traffic count, the commercial land area um, has been accounted for, the residential units have been accounted for, and, and so the, only the one signal at Mott Drive was necessary there. Okay. And one other comment, potentially Ridgeway Drive, 
uh, you'll see it does uh, stub out. It does end at the eastern property line where the deans have their undeveloped land. Mm -hmm. Ridgeway Drive is proposed to be extended uh, further over to Fox Ridge Drive to the east eventually. Oh. So it would provide another outlet as well okay. for anybody that would perhaps would be going east. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner. Mysky. So, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Anderson. I, I would like to hear from the applicant if possible, just to get some clarification. So uh, I guess public disclosure is that I intentionally did not read this because my first inclination was, in fact, was this was the same applicant that's come forward regarding the same property um, under the guise of affordable housing uh, for the area. So I would like to hear from the applicant, if possible, to kind of give some more clarification. I think we've heard some, some public comment. So can we do that? I think, I think that sounds appropriate. If we could have you come forward and speak to that. Could I step in real quickly? Please. Okay. I just want to real quickly step in. I, I understand and appreciate your desire for additional clarification. I, from, for purposes, we've already had an individual comments for this evening. I want to make sure we understand what our role is as Planning and Zoning Commission members this Thank evening. Uh, you, under Mr. this Sir. application, your final site plan approval is for an administrative review, not legislative in nature. So there's a distinction between what your role is and uh, for this evening as opposed to what it might be in other situations. Under the legislative side of the world, you can take into consideration a number of other items, your personal opinions, your feelings, and other things like that with regard to your final approval and review. In the administrative side of the world, what we really, really try to focus on is your and I think in my in our prior education opportunities, I've, I've identified this as just the facts, ma'am, kind of scenario. So it is a does it comply with the provisions of the UDC? And we focus on our efforts on the UDC provisions. So, okay. Mr. Zur, if I understand you correctly, you are saying that we are to see if this application meets the codes in the UDC strictly as as it is stated, and not. Um, the provisions within your findings of fact are where you need to be focusing your attention at. And, and Commissioner Anderson, I don't want to, to forestall you from asking your questions. I just want to make sure that we stay no, focused I on those. No, I think you did make it clear, so it's probably not applicable as far as a question, so I'll defer. Okay. Thank you. But Thank we you. would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Do we have any other comments by the commission or questions for staff? So will this be presented again under a legislative type of discussion? This particular item, a site plan approval, does mm -hmm. not go on to council. So okay. the commission has final authority yep. uh, for decision. Uh, the applicant is the only person that has the right to appeal any decision you make to the council. So if you were to place a condition that's unacceptable to them or uh, a decision that they uh, was unacceptable to the applicant, then the applicant could appeal it to council. But only the applicant can do that at this point. Mr. Canarad, if I can have you clarify again. Um, so are you saying that the commission is the final say on this particular plan, site plan or final, uh, yeah, site plan? Yes, sir. I'll and just... that will not be going to council? That, that is correct. The previous item on the agenda, the final plat, will be going to council. And that would be where such questions could be addressed by the council if they so wished? Council, council can choose to ask what questions they feel are, are appropriate, and uh, but uh, it'll, it'll only be acting on the uh, final plan. The site plan that's current case in front of you is final decision by the commission. Okay, so if there were questions when they look at the final plat that were in concerns, they could certainly um, that that could impact a future need for possibly a, a revised site plan if. If that was, if that was, if if that was to happen, 
Yeah, if, if the council, uh, for example, <clears throat> so we can see this again. Final plan, or 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 made a change or something that affected the site plan, the site plan may have to come back to you. But okay. Thank you for the clarification, Mr. Cantoret. So either way, just for clarification. So either way, the commission votes. Still, the final plat still goes to the council for discussion. Okay. Yes, a final plat. Yes. And yes, the final plat does. Just the so site, you know, the site plan does. Not. You would have had a preliminary site plan that would have come forward as well too a prior, which would have had more a, an, a greater analysis of it. What we are trying to do is make sure that the preliminary site plan matches with your final site plan. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Hanner. I just want to clarify that that lot number three looks a little slim, at least from your map. There is room there to provide for parking, the facility or the structure, a backyard of some sort, I would assume, and the setback necessary to keep it from getting into the neighbors, into the residential R1 area. Is there? Uh, yes, there is. Hard I brought up me to see. I brought up the site plan. Uh, yes, all the setbacks are met. The uh, driveway depth is adequate uh, for parking a vehicle. There is a slope to the property, so the uh, rear of the buildings um, is, is greater on those particular uh, structures on lot three just because of the slope. Uh, uh, the buildings will be somewhat elevated compared to the single family homes in Foxhaven to the, to the west. Uh, but, but there is adequate room for all the buildings. They're adequately separated. Thank you. Mr. Cataret, um, you mentioned the back side of the structures where the slope was. Does that mean that the, the rear of the building is taller in height than the front of the building? Yes, sir, it and will be. Does it still meet within the, I, I, I want to say, I'm a 50 foot requirement? Yes, it still, will, it still will comply with the height. In essence, what it'll look like is if you have a an eight-foot basement wall on the rear of the structure, although there's no basement, it just it will be the, the concrete wall will be ex, will be exposed. Right, like a, like a home with an exposed basement that I have to paint next week. Yeah. <laughs> and I believe that's illustrated in your elevations. Okay, of course, thank you. I see commissioners reading their packets. I'm wanting to give you time if you're formulating other questions. If we have no other questions, we need to address this case with either approval, recommendation for approval or not to approve. Just to remind everyone, we're looking at the final site plan and not the site plat, the final plat, which was already approved. Uh, I will try to move this forward. Um, I would like to make a motion to accept city staff proposed findings as fact and forward the case number 14017 to city council for approval. Is there any further discussion of case 14017? Chairman. <clears throat> you are not forwarding this to city council. Oh, at this oh point. that's right. There is no that's recommendation. Right. Okay, that's that confusing between the plan, my own statement that I didn't follow between the plat and the plan. Okay, so let me go back and all 
All right, let's try this again. I move to accept the city staff proposed findings as fact and approve the Ridgeway Villas at the Legends site plan, case number 14017. Is there any further discussion of this case? We have a motion. I did not hear a second. I have not heard a second either. I'll second it. Okay, we have a, a second by Commissioner Pfizer. Okay. All those in favor of recommendation of appro approval of case number 14017 to move to accept city staff findings as, as fact in case 14017, raise a hand, please. All those in favor. That's all those opposed, same sign. We have five in favor, one opposed, zero abstentions, and we have the needed majority of five on the commission to approve the case. All right, let's move on to the next case. Next case is uh, case number 14018, the UDC annual review and report. Mr. Canaret, will you please present the case for the commission? Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, before you this evening is the annual review and report for the Unified Development Code. Uh, back in 2012, the uh, commission commenced a program to complete an annual review uh, of the UDC in June of each year. Uh, so the, the process is that staff prepares the report outlining activities that have affected the UDC over the previous year and identifying any issues or concerns with any pro provision within the UDC. What happens with this report is really entirely up to the commission. Uh, there are a couple of recommendations from staff. And so if you do decide to proceed forward with consideration of the recommendations from staff, then we would schedule a, a uh, an amendment for for action at a future meeting so the only action that is that is requested or occurring tonight is is direction if the commission has any uh, for staff to do further work on on anything that we discussed this evening they just quickly go through the report on the summary of previous amendments there there were three amendments that had a, have occurred since uh, the uh, annual review last year uh, the uh, 16th amendment to the UDC uh, incorporated changes that were discussed at your annual review a year ago. Uh, so a number of items that uh, we had talked about uh, were incorporated into the 16th Amendment. The 17th Amendment, approved back in February of 2014, had uh, three uh, revisions that were proposed uh, uh, to the UDC. And then the 18th Amendment, also approved in February, is where we uh, allowed accessory dwelling units upon uh, certain properties within the city. So those were the three amendments we've done over the past year. There were no declaratory rulings issued by staff uh, over the previous year. Uh, so that kind of leads into a uh, staff's review of the UDC and what we do uh, over the entire year, uh, if staff comes across a question uh, from a property owner or a builder, developer, or if uh, an interpretation of the code is made by staff. We try to take notes upon what, you know, what that issue was, what the question was, or if there is something in the code that we feel could be clarified or, or amended. Uh, so we have a couple of, uh, of suggestions this evening. Uh, none of these are uh, pressing matters, but they are something that perhaps as we in the future look to amend the code, we can incorporate these into an amendment. The first, uh, the first item deals with uh, the, our FEMA floodplain. Uh, currently, our code 
uh, does not allow any residential lot to be platted into the floodplain area. So any residential subdivision that you see coming forward, no part of any of those lots is floodplain exist on. Uh, that was a requirement that we, we added to our code many years ago because some of our existing subdivisions along streams um, do have parts of individuals' rear yards that encroach into the floodplain. So that's something that we totally you know, we wanted to avoid. Uh, but that, that provision does not currently exist for commercial lots, and we feel it should exist for commercial lots. So uh, that would be one proposal is that no platted lot can encroach into the, uh, the theme of floodplain of the 100-year flood elevation uh, for any um, non-residential construction. The second proposed amendment is in our sign code. This is more of a clarification on how um, staff has interpreted the code before this deals with our monument signs and and what we have done out of fairness um, if you would to a, an existing business if we have a commercial development that has an elevation that slopes away from the adjacent roadway or happens to be lower than the adjacent roadway the way our uh, if they want to install a monument sign the way our code specifies we measure the height is from the ground area around the sign the intent of the uh, sign code, we believe, has always been the height of the sign is really based upon traffic that exists along the highway and vehicular traffic. So what we have done is we have always taken the measurement from the elevation of the sidewalk. So a few examples um, identified as far as businesses recently, uh, CVS has an elevation below 58 highway, uh, Golden Corral an elevation below 58 highway, and so for the, the measurement of how high the sign could be, the maximum six foot height, we simply use the measurement of the adjacent sidewalk or curb and go six foot high from there, and that's the maximum height. So what you'll see on a few of those signs uh, is an elevated base of the sign. Um, the copy area does not change, and uh, again, we feel about the maximum height being measured from the adjacent roadway. Uh, surface or the, the, the sidewalk is is appropriate. So we provided an illustration that shows how we do that and we have always felt that that, that is uh, fair. That is how we've interpreted code. We thought it would be best to incorporate that into the uh, actual language of the code. So we would propose that the illustration and the code language um, indicates su such. And then a third amendment, um, again another minor item, but it it um, clarifies a, a couple of uh, terms that are utilized in our code but are not defined. The term subject property uh, is dealt with when we do, specifically we do notifications for public hearings, when we do notifications for rezonings or conditional use permits, we require notices to be sent out to uh, neighbors within a certain distance from the subject property. So we're simply trying to define the subject property. And then our uh, code provision uh, dealing with undeveloped lots, we needed to define what an undeveloped lot is. So those are just two terms that we would like to add to our definition section of the code. So those, those are the items that staff specifically bringing forward uh, for commission discussion and direction on whether you think we should proceed with preparing an amendment for your formal consideration in the future. A uh, question for you, Mr. Kenderant, on the second issue with the signs and with the site being at a lower elevation than the road or the sidewalk, is it possible for a plan, a site plan to come in and think that they could have their sign be at a higher elevation than the city code based on digging a hole to put their business in? I, that may sound interesting, but it is something that someone might find a strategy to have their sign higher than a free flat site that they did not build into it would the measurement would still be I, they could they wouldn't be able to go higher than what our code would or what this interpretation would allow no matter what their elevation is however low they go with the elevation or dig a hole to put the base of the side in, the site could never be higher than the six foot from the Six elevation foot, okay. of the sidewalk or street. With, with one exception, though, if you look, uh, for example, I, I mentioned CVS, you take uh, across the street where Walgreens is located at, they're elevated. And so we don't reduce the, the height of the sign in that case. It is 
that property was elevated before, and that's where we take the elevation is from the, the elevation of the ground around the side. We would not allow somebody to build up the elevation in order to boost the side up higher. I think it's hot. The only way they would try to make the side higher is by boosting the elevation up of the property. I, I, I know it sounds like it would be expensive to do such a crazy idea, but um, if you were to put the sign on a 50 foot building in a hole that was, you know, uh, for the first part where the height was, uh, is it only talking about monument signs? Yes. Okay. Well, then yes. there you go. That yes, only monument signs. But okay. I did want to point out if. <laughs> In the inverse, if the property is elevated above the sidewalk, we still don't measure from the sidewalk. If the property is naturally elevated, that's where we that's where we take it from. All right. And, is and whatever that elevation is where the side is located. Copy size would remain the same anyway. Yes, the copy area always remains the same. Yes. Is there any discussion amongst the commission on these items for possible amendments for the future in the eighties UDC? And do we, uh, Mr. Cataract, did you have some uh, questions that we needed to address at the end for possible yes, uh, future investigations? Yes, not, not directly a recommendation, but two items have come up, actually three items have come up, two are in your report. Um, one of them, the first question I had is, is should, should we be looking at restricting the height of a flagpole? Uh, this question comes up, um, Really, the only uh, flagpole that we had of any significant height that I, that I can recall uh, was the flagpole in front of the Orchelands, which is the city Eagle, Eagle, uh, Eagle Park flagpole, which is approximately 70 foot high. And uh, that, that's a flag that's existed in the city for some time. Um, it is you know, a, a city property or city easement area where we have that flag. We did have a request come in uh, when Golden Corral was looking to build in Raymore. Um, and we do not have a limitation on flagpole. Uh, they, there is limitation. I mean, they would not be able to put a Golden Corral banner on That's the flag on the flagpole. Ask. That is a commercial sign. But they certainly could put a city of Raymore, state of Missouri, a, a U.S. flag. Uh, but there is was no height limitation. They came in and put a 60-foot uh, height, you know, pole sign. Uh, you know, it, what it does is it brings visibility to the property, which is what the intent was. Um, the, uh, another restaurant that is uh, familiar for doing this type of activity um, is the uh, Perkins. That's what I was going to mention. Uh, typically has that, and often you'll see car lots, especially new car dealers, put very large flags and flagpoles up. Um, I am not uh, suggesting we limit the size of the flag, but it is, it is allowable to limit the size or height of the flagpole. I'm not suggesting that we should. I'm simply bringing it up because mm -hmm. the question came up with, with the uh, Golden Corral. There was no limit. They put the flagpole up. I have heard no comment, positive or negative. I just wanted to bring that item and see if that was something you thought we should look at. Does the code stipulate what flags, what constitutes a flag and what constitutes a corporate banner? Is that Only detailed? Only the, def the definition of a sign, I believe, would cover that. So we have a pretty detailed definition of sign that, that talks about you know, logos and, and images right. and, and the like. So if, if it met the definition, if what they wanted to put up as a flag met the definition of a sign, they wouldn't be allowed to do it. The second item uh, that I have, again, you know, uh, not in a particular uh, order of importance or anything, but a, a question came up recently about a, a a process that we have in place on our conditional use permits. Uh, certain uses uh, are allowed in the city, but they're only allowed as a conditional use, meaning that uh, we generally feel that a specific use is appropriate for X zoning district, but since X zoning district exists in different areas throughout the city, there may be some locations where that use is appropriate and some where it's not appropriate, even though the zoning district is the same. And that's, that's why we make that use a conditional use. Um, and so, so the, the issue that comes up is that we, we have a, a project maybe that's moving forward and they need the conditional use permit which goes through the public hearing process. We do notification to neighbors. We go through all that process. Uh, but they may also need another um, uh, 
approval, whether it's a deviation to a development standard or a deviation to a, a um, you know, maybe a setback or a parking requirement, and that requires a separate review process. And what, what, what I'm suggesting is that it, it is common, and we actually have it built in in our code for rezonings, um, in that you can come in for a plan district zoning where you can, you have the property zoned a certain way, but then you can have certain requests for deviations from the standard. Uh, a common one would be a, a residential developer coming in asking for single family zoning, but needing the side yard setback adjusted. Uh, that's a very common one. Uh, we have other, other examples where other standards have been um, deviated from when the zoning occurred. What this is simply suggesting is that the, the idea of deviating from the standard, we, we, do, we still want to have a public hearing, but what we're trying to do is uh, incorporate the different steps of approval into one step. It seems to simplify the overall process. We're already talking about the use. Let's say, for example, it's a, uh, a car repair facility requires a condition use permit. So they come in and we notify everybody about what the use is and they can come in and make their specific request for the car repair. If they have another request where they want to deviate a parking standard or a setback, it's, it can be discussed at the same time as we're talking about the use. Rather than saying we take the use and do this public hearing here and then we do the parking variance here and then we do the setback variance here, it's, it's, we're talking about the same property, the same project, we have a public hearing where everybody has the right to speak on any part of the project. It just seems to be a more expeditious way of reviewing the project rather than all these individual steps. Um, and again, what we're modeling this after is, is our rezoning. So if, if somebody wants to do multiple steps, they do the plan district and do it as one. I'm simply saying, let's take that process and use it for condition to use permits. Not everybody's gonna ask for a, a deviation but when they do, it just seems to make sense to do it only once in one, one setting. A conditional use, just one comment, just like the rezoning, it comes to this body for recommendation and it goes on to city council for another public hearing at city council. Uh, so we're not eliminating any steps per se as far as when the public has the right to speak. It's just trying to ex expedite it into one request rather than multiple. So that, that was the idea with that particular item. Did you say there was a third uh, question to there is. If you okay. want to handle them well, together. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I do Great. have a question. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, Jim, on the uh, uh, things like a building setback or, or a parking spaces, currently, would, would that be a variance and then go before the Board of Adjustment? It would, yes. So cur it is a different body than the Commission. It's a very good question. Um, and I didn't mention that. So if, it, if somebody comes in for a specific variance to a, not as part of the zoning, but a variance to a setback or a parking, they want to reduce the number of parking spaces, yes, they have to go to the Board of Adjustment. Um, in, our, in our UDC, as I mentioned, the, the rezoning, we have taken that, um, the, the ability to do a variance and built it into the rezoning with the planned overlay district. That's in essence what I'm talking about here. I'm not trying to you know, necessarily pull the authority from the Board of Adjustment, but what I'm trying to do is, is simplify the process mm -hmm. and, and, and it, making it one board that, that an applicant has to go to, but still be able to accomplish the same thing. Um, and at the same time, respecting the notification process to make sure anybody that has a concern about that parking number of parking spaces or whatever it might be, they still have the right to talk to some group about that. It shifts from the Board of Adjustment to the Planning Commission and then City Council. Right now they would only speak to the Board and that would be it, the Board of Adjustment for a variance. But under this process, a, a neighbor with a concern could speak not only to the Planning Commission but to City Council as well. Um, so it, it may even add to their ability to express their concern. Thank you. As far as that question goes, I think that would be a, a good use of a work session sometime to maybe go back and review some, some cases that we've looked at and show how that would have had an impact on the, on the, the actions of the past so we can understand uh, based on what might occur in the future. Yeah, very good suggestion. We can definitely do, we've had some examples, we can do that. 
Commissioner Hanner. Do you have the language proposed for that yet? I, I do not, no. No. But I would follow the process that we do for the rezoning. No, I, your, your, your argument makes absolute sense. And, and if a public hearing is there and the public comes in to express their concerns about the use as presented, and then it gets approved through the a recommended approval through us, but then a, and a variance comes in afterwards, it's a day late and a dollar short for the public to be able to, to weigh in on their, the changes that have been proposed. Is that? Well, they, they still would have the ability, they would be notified of the variance hearing that would go in front of the Board of Adjustment so the neighbors would have, or anybody concerned would have an opportunity to express their concern to the Board of Adjustment. But at a, the Board of Adjustment is a final decision on, on the variance. And that would be, they would not be able to express their concern to a council member or at that action. So it, it does provide, at least as I look at it, a little bit more opportunity uh, you know, for the resident if, if, they, if a developer specifically asks for a, a variation and goes through this process. But this just tries to tie it up into one review. Let's just talk about the project as one and address it as a whole rather than our current process breaks it up into different pieces. Um, and it just seems to be a better way to deal with development activities to try to take care of it at, as one. Mr. Zerv, have you reviewed that? Would we be stepping on the BOA's toes, the Board of Adjustments? I mean, is that out of our lane? Well, I think it depends upon what we see as far as the draft of language that Jim has provided. I think we've got other examples in cities where that's occurred. So I don't think it's way out of line. We have not had the opportunity to evaluate or, or investigate that, but I know that it is a prospect in other cities. Then I'll yield to the, what the vice chair had to say, and maybe we'll talk about it during the. Just, just to clarify, we've got two sets in this case. We're looking at um, three items that are possible uh, suggestions for amendments to the UDC, and then right now we're concerning just questions that might be researched for future possibilities of of amendments, but this particular question we're looking at is certainly something that's maybe in its infancy. Is that correct, Mr. Gatteret? Uh, yes, that, that is correct. Okay. And then I had one item, one item that wasn't included in your pack, but it came up because it came up very recently, and it's <clears throat> it's really kind of fits in with, I believe, the, the, the recommendations that we currently had. It's more of a clarification of code. Uh, and it, it, it deals with home occupations. And uh, in, our, in our UDC, home occupations are allowed. Uh, the idea is that an individual is able to, to establish uh, a business office or, or run, a, run a business out of their home with the idea being uh, the neighbors don't even know that it's occurring on the property. So we have very specific requirements, no outside signs. Um, you know, it can only use a percentage of the home. It has to be, uh, unless you have acreage, it has to be done within the home. It can't be done in an accessory shed or something of that sort. Uh, there, is a, there is one line in the code that talks about, uh, and I'll read it first. It reads, uh, no commodities may be displayed or sold on the premises except that which is produced on the premises or that are normal and customary to the home occupation. Um, what came up recently, and my concern is that uh, what, I, what I believe the requirement should say, what we don't want to have happen is to have a display that's visible from the outside that it can't be displayed on the outside of the home. I think the intent was that commodities maybe uh, uh, that go along with the business could be inside the home. You know, if somebody were to come to the home, you would be able to have the commodity available. But what I would recommend or want to see is that we clearly just state no outside display uh, of commodities or items for sale of that sort. Um, it has come up, um, I, am, I am addressing it right now. Um, uh, through the enforcement process, and I believe I can take care of it, but I, I want clarification of the language is all. I think the intent has always been, it, it, the whole idea of the home occupation, you don't know what's there. Well, if they're displaying products for sale because they make them in their home, you know a business is there and that defeats the purpose. So I think we need to clarify that. Jim. Jim. Oh, go ahead. I apologize. Sure. Real quick, just to make sure, we're not talking about the individual who's going to sell his motorcycle or his boat in the for sale by owner out in the front yard at the end of the day. Is the, we're talking about commodities that would be of a, a smaller nature or something along those lines, right? That's, that's right, yes. yes. Uh, my question, Mr. Cataret, was um, would that include even um, the name of a business on a mailbox 
today I happened to be driving around because I had a break. So I drove around and, and uh, drove around Peculiar and I saw just on a back road um, the name of this person's automotive shop and you really couldn't tell that there was a business other than there were a lot of cars there, but obviously it was a rural area and very much different than what we're looking at here. But the name of, the reason I knew it was a business is it was on the mailbox, yeah. but it was also their home. It, I that mean, would be code, a sign though, correct? Our, our code clearly says no signs <clears throat> are permitted for the home occupation. So it would be, we'd have to make the determination if that's actually a sign. Um, and if it was, it would not be allowed if it was a sign for the business. Are there any other concerns or questions from the commission? I think then uh, I'd like to direct the staff to research the recommendations to the possible amendments to the UDC and also research information on these questions that were brought up that I think we would have interest in looking at in a future work session. Commissioner Hanner. Uh, let's go back to 46 or 460.080. You're talking about the lots being plotted on a FEMA. That include parking as well. And I mean, is it every portion of the lot? Yeah, yes every portion of the lot that that is our current proposal and yeah. we've compared that to what our fema map looks like to see how much of an impact this would have well, we will need to do that mm -hmm. you know it is you know i've listed it here uh as as a uh, recommendation yes yeah, so we will do the, the full research if it comes forward to you as a as, a, as an amendment and so the staff report will identify that and so I think my concern would not be for the future as much as it would be what we may have already approved that would now fall into this category. So those would be grandfathered, I would assume. Yeah, yes, they would be grandfathered, but it does place a non-conforming tag on the property. So it's, it's something to be aware of. So we, we will have to look at that, yes. To uh, clarify, Commissioner Hanner, would that be in reference to uh, UDC amendment number 19 that we just um, looked at recently in the past meetings as far as the uh, the floodplain no I'm talking about his recommendation on here about yes adding that but when you were talking about grandfathering no what I'm talking about what I mean is for the properties that we've already maybe approved for development okay that fall now into this or that would become this would cause them to be in, in non-compliance. And we certainly have commercial properties within the floodplain that have part of the lots within the floodplain. Yeah, we definitely do. So we need to take a close look at that. But yeah. Thank you. Um, we'll move to the next part on the agenda. Um, if we can have Mr. Zero give us the city council report. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, again, Jonathan Zur with the Capcom Willard Law Firm Attorneys for the City. I have been provided with a agenda from an agenda from the May 12, 2014 City Council meeting. Uh, it is uh, lacking a whole lot of stuff as far as Planning and Zoning Commission is concerned. So I'm I'm kind of stretching here. Forgive me, but I, I, we have identified two items that may, may be of some interest. One is the acceptance of the 2013 curb replacement project. This has been part of some of our discussions with regard to uh, developments uh, or new developments within the city of uh, Raymore. Um, there was a resolution, pat or I'm sorry, acceptance of the uh, 2013 uh, curb replacement project uh, allocated with the final payment of $14,634.25. And I would note that there was a budget amendment for that as well, which would have added an additional 900 feet in the Meadows subdivision uh, for purposes of uh, curb replacement. That is really the, and it's a stretch, for <laughs> what your involvement and your interest would be from planning and zoning. Uh, I'll defer to the mayor. Do you think there's well, anything I'll, else I'll, that you can I'll, add? I'll, I'll add just a little bit there, uh, as it's action that hasn't occurred by the council yet, uh, but there seems to be some uh, uh, interest in the council to uh, uh, once again accelerate the uh, curb replacement uh, if I, if I remember correctly, uh, the, um, the amount originally budgeted was $100,000 a year, and that was increased to $300,000 a year. 
uh, tripling the amount of money uh, that's being spent on curb replacement. And from the uh, chatter or the idle comments at the end of the meeting that I've heard from council members, uh, it seems like there might be some interest in increasing that amount yet again. So hopefully we have the money to do that. So. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor Kirkhoff. Um, unless there's anyone else has questions about the city council report, I'll ask Mr. Catarat to give us the commission, the staff report for the planning pipeline. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, you get your packet. I, I provided the, uh, it was a report, I guess it was titled for April. Uh, when we set off the packet, we did not have the May report done, and I'm actually still working on that. But it provides some, some information on the activities that are occurring. Uh, I do want to note uh, your next meeting, June 17th. We do have one item on the agenda uh, for that meeting, so that will be held. I do not have anything yet scheduled for your July meetings. Uh, July 1st, I believe, we have a scheduled meeting. Uh, so those are the activities uh, we're working on. We, it was mentioned about the UDC 19th Amendment, uh, which was our stream setback uh, amendment that was forwarded on to City Council at their uh, May 12th meeting. They did uh, uh, defer any action um, until their June 23rd meeting and then provided some direction for staff to do some additional research on, on the topic. And so we have been completing that and we'll be providing an update uh, to Council, I believe, at their next work session meeting on June 16th. Um, the second item is just a reminder, I believe all the commission members were invited to the uh, volunteer uh, recognition breakfast. I believe it's scheduled for June, Wednesday, June 18th. Hopefully everybody received a notification of that. So you're all welcome to be, it's at Gregory's, I believe at eight o'clock on Wednesday, June 18th. So I just wanted to uh, remind the uh, commission members of that. That's all I have, sir. Thank you for that reminder. Um, let's move to the public comment portion of our agenda. I invite any members of the public who would like to speak to the commission, invite them to come to the podium. Seeing no one, I will close the public comment. I invite the commission and Mayor Kirkhoff to make comments. Start with start with Commissioner Meiske. No comment. Commissioner Hanner. Um, so I want to say thank you for indulging my absence in both past and future. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'll see you guys probably around the middle of July. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Pfizer. Um, today is the last day of school here in Raymore, which you probably know. Yeah, I know that. Um, so I doubt that there are any kids watching this, but um, I hope they all have a good, safe, and happy summer. And please wear sunscreen. And that's all I have to say. I did see a lot of students uh, walking on our sidewalks today, and not in the street, but on the sidewalk. Uh, Commissioner Anderson? Uh, no comment this evening. Uh, Mayor Kirkhoff? Well, I'm happy to see there was a, everybody had no comments because that frees up a, a lot of time for me. So, and it's only a little after eight. Uh, we have plenty of time for my comments, and, uh, and I do have a number here. So, <laughs> uh, actually, just a few comments. Uh, the, the, you mentioned students, and it's uh, something I know the council members and I get a big kick out of during the council meetings during the school year, when we do have an audience. Uh, it's great fun to have a room full of students. Uh, occasionally they do get uh, the courage to come up and speak during the uh, uh, public, com uh, pu public comments uh, portion of the uh, meeting. So, uh, the, uh, Jim mentioned the volunteer breakfast, and I'd encourage you all, if you're able, uh, it's free food, and that should be incentive enough. <laughs> so. And uh, speaking of food, uh, earlier this evening I attended the uh, farmer's market, which uh, opened again today. Uh, it, it was very well attended by vendors and uh, customers both. Um, and, and as usual, although it was some 90 degrees out and quite humid, as soon as you hit the farmer's market, it was shady, uh, 70 degrees, a light breeze. It was, it was truly amazing. So you need to check out the farmer's market if you haven't already. So that's all I have for the, this evening. Thank you, Mayor and the Commission, uh, for your comments. Um, I guess for myself, I want to uh, thank the rest of the commission 
hopefully I did an adequate job this evening stepping in for our normal chairman. Um, and um, every once in a while I do have students ask us about these meetings and typically I get out the map of the city and show them, well, your street is not part of our city. Maybe someday if you were to voluntarily <laughs> annex yourself, you know, you would be part of our city and, you know, but uh, I, that's always interesting that they see me preparing sometimes and then do have questions. So it's, that's good for them to get that education. Um, well, that's all the comments I have. Do we have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Mr. Vice, I have a motion that we close the meeting tonight. Do we have a second? Second. Motion has been made by Commissioner Hanner and seconded by Commissioner Anderson that we adjourn the meeting. All those that approve this motion, show hand. And we have a unanimous, so we are adjourned. Thank you.